Lord Putnam is one of the towering figures of the British film industry. As a producer, he won an Oscar for his work on Chariots of Fire. He also won a BAFTA for that film and a Michael Balkan Award. He also won a BAFTA for Best Film for his work on The Killing Fields. And in 2006, he was awarded an Academy Fellowship. He's been a member of the trustee board and was chair of that board from 2002 to 2004. And since officially retiring in 1998, he's been heavily involved both in education and the environment. So shortly after becoming a producer, um, you joined BAFTA, yeah. and then around 1976, you became involved with the BAFTA committee. I'm just curious about how you perceived BAFTA at that point in time. It was very gentlemanly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the chairman when I joined was Richard Corston. He was a very nice man, incidentally. But it was, uh, it, it was very, very gentlemanly. And Colin Young, who was the director of the National Film Intelligence School, and myself were the sort of, um, we were tolerated. Uh, I mean, I'm quite interesting. I'd love to go back and look at the minutes of some of the meetings uh, in that we were trying to raise issues about training, for example. Uh, and that wasn't seen as being anything to do with it. As you progressed through the organisation and became more involved, um, previous interviewees in this series have talked about their idea of having a mission statement or a goal. Was education yours then? Was that, that the priority as when you came on board and going forward? Yes, because my colleague on the board, the only person I really knew, was Colin Young, we did kind of hammer home the benefits of, 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 of training. And we tried very much to get BAFTA to swing in behind the National Film Intelligence School, which hadn't been going for that long, uh, and saying, look, this is a center of excellence. You're talking about excellence. We are trying to build a center of excellence. We're trying to make sure that that center of excellence is as open as it possibly can be. And surely there's a, a complete synchronicity of aim here. We never really achieved that. I don't think we've ever reached, have reached a point where the NFTS and BAFTA were in lockstep, but we did achieve a reasonable amount of sympathy. Um, looking at the prestige side of the organisation, the awards, could you, 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 your films that you worked on um, right from the outset started to win awards and mm. you nominated for awards. How important was that in terms of your career and how it progressed? I think it was important. It was important too. It gave me self-confidence, that's for sure. It allowed you to feel you'd broken a, what did feel like a glass ceiling. You know, we talk about glass ceilings only in terms of, 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 of women. There were other glass ceilings. So I felt that, uh, for example, because it was very much with Alan, that Alan and I had broken through something that was important. You know, when I first started with Ridley and Alan, we were, I'm not going to say disparaged because that's far too strong a word, but we were guys who came from the commercial world. And really, really was the film industry, uh, which was very Oxbridge. Was the film industry really going to start working with these guys who come out of ad agencies and made two-minute commercials and everything else? It's interesting the way that you you talk there about the landscape of film because over the years there have been many, many comparisons with you and, and Michael Balkan. Mm -hmm. And you won the Michael Balkan Award for Chariots of Fire. You talk about a certain kind of elitism when it came to certain groups in Britain, but did you feel this attempt to place Britain on the map globally did you feel that you had challenges and problems with a certain viewpoint of keeping it British? Yes and no. I remember that when I did Killing Fields after Chariots of Fire, there was some criticism that I'd kind of gone, gone international, that I'd, I'd lost track, because I'd done Local Hero, which was seen as very British, but that I'd lost track of my you know, national roots. I never ever saw it that way, so I mean, it came as a total sort of surprise to me. But I think there's an, you touched an interesting point. So Mick Balkan, who I knew and loved, he was a lovely man, I knew him towards the end of his life. Mick Balkan was um, Jewish, Birmingham, and I think always viewed himself as an outsider. Although in a sense he became apparently the ultimate insider, I think he always felt an outsider. In fact, I know he did. I had enough conversations with him. Now, what will surprise you even more is I, my best chum and person I was closest to in all of this was, uh, was Dickie Attenborough. There was no point, I don't think, that Dickie didn't feel something of an outsider. And Dickie's radicalism was driven by the same thing. He, he, he loved being connected to, the, the, as it were, the mainstream of show business. But at the same time, I think he was always a slightly sceptical outsider. His number one passion was the quality of what was emerging from RADA. His number two passion was what was happening. He got very, very involved early on, as did I, 
in the first board at the National Film and Television School. So Dick similarly was always looking for the new and how you could promote this industry as an industry, get it to see itself as an industry. Uh, so you've got three people here, and I'd love to, I mean, I love the idea of associating myself with both of them, I really do. But I would say Mick Balkan, myself, and Attenborough always regarded ourselves as outsiders, constantly questioning the status quo. On 4th December 1995, there was an event here, the Interactive Revolution, and it feels like the moment the BAFTA threw its hat in to the interactive ring. What was it like sort of raising this, this idea that BAFTA should be involved with interactive technology and interactive entertainment? Well, I'm careful how I answer this because I don't want to sound like a sort of hero figure flinging myself against the walls of, uh, you know, of the establishment. The truth is one of the toughest battles I ever found myself into. I was absolutely convinced that we either embraced the digital world and the, the world of games, and game of, you know, that, that innovative world, or it would go off and do it itself. I believed from the outset that it could be as big a business, as big an industry in its own right as, as we were, we in the film and television business were and that uh, we should throw our arms around it, because I felt that by offering them the BAFTA mask, it would allow an industry that could go able uh, to see itself as, as, as pursuing excellence. I was absolutely certain that the BAFTA mask could give, it an give that industry an aspiration that was valuable to, to all of us. I came up against really extraordinarily vocal opposition on the uh, committee. So no, it was, uh, it was hard very, very hard. All the restructurings that I've been involved with with BAFTA have been difficult because it's, I think it's this insider-outsider thing that I think once you feel you're, feel you're on the inside, you feel you've got this thing to protect. And for me, what you will always need on the board at BAFTA, you need some people who are prepared to have a race memory and conserve what's best, but another group of people who are constantly saying, actually, this could be better that could be better, we can improve this. And I think, again, you've been fortunate, in Amanda and Kevin, you have had a team at, at the top who have constantly questioned whether there are better ways of doing things. It's interesting looking at the timeline of the organisation that many people say BAFTA came into the modern age when it, the decision was made to move the awards forward in front of the Oscars. But looking at the interactive awards in 1998 and taking into account from that, that December 1995 conference, and the initial discussion of the awards, yeah. it took another two years yeah. for them to actually take place. But it strikes me that that really is the line that you draw for where BAFTA shifted yes. in many ways. It's, 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 it's embracing a wider landscape again. I think that's absolutely true. I think what actually happened is that BAFTA started looking forwards instead of backwards. I think BAFTA had instinctively, even if it were only a year backwards, you were celebrating the films of last year. And that developed a sort of mindset, as opposed to as opposed to appreciating the opportunities of the industry as it went forward. There was a great push with the Blair government from '97 onwards in terms of interactivity, in terms of the internet. Mm. Not so much pressure from a government, but did you feel it helped that across society as a whole that there was this shift? Yes, but it didn't start in '97. Uh, the really important point period, I think, was '92 to '97 where we had thought, my own party had thought we were going to win the 92 election, we didn't. And we hunkered down and started working on policies. And the policy, one of the policies we identified were what we now term the creative industries. That we coined the phrase. So we were very lucky. We quite early on got Chris Smith in and committed to becoming, you know, if we won the next election, he was going to be Secretary of State. So we actually had a very coherent policy group who were able to look across the piece. And this is where the conversations, again, having Dickie here, the conversations with BAFTA became rather fertile. It was what, you know, what role could BAFTA play in this? What did excellence look like? Uh, how, how could we change uh, attitudes to how large an industry we are there were or could be? These were big issues. And of course, BAFTA was an, an, an important weapon in, in all of that. I just want to come back to 1998 and the first Interactive Awards. What were they like? Uh, they were great. I mean, I found myself in an extraordinary situation of being the, um, the presenter. <laughs> the fact that was, uh, we, we brought in a couple of comedians to keep, keep the show on the road. Uh, they were great. I mean, I think we got a lot of things right. The first thing we did was we decided we were going to have a, a Life Achievement Award, despite the fact that it was a brand new industry. Uh, and we were going to celebrate the, the early heroes, the, 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 the Livingstons, and, uh, who, who made this, this industry possible. And once we'd done that, we'd captured them. Uh, so Ian Livingston very early on and a number of others. Once we captured the, the, 
the senior figures in the games industry, we were probably in much, much, much firmer ground. I think the other great surprise was, again, it's all in the archives, uh, we thought we would have a modest turnout and we actually had a room that was packed to the gills. And I think everyone, including myself, were amazed at once we'd made the decision how popular it was. And looking to the future with BAFTA, what would you like to see it do in the coming years? I genuinely, I, I, could, I understand the reluctance, and there's always been the reluctance for BAFTA to allow itself to become politicised. On the other hand, we are in, whether we like it or not, we're in a political environment. But I think BAFTA has to accept the fact, as does the BFI, that you can't always hide behind the fact of not offending a minister. Sometimes you don't achieve change without offending, and, that couldn't, and that's an apolitical statement. I don't mind if the minister from the Labour Party, whoever it might be. There are certain ideals and important and, and, and principles, that's the right word, certain principles that BAFTA must, must, must stand for. Thank you, Lord Putnam. Great pleasure. I applied for an attachment, in those days you had attachments, um, to um, a new programme which was being set, going to be set up for BBC Two for preschool children. It didn't have a name. Um, I'd never, ever been in a television studio. I knew absolutely nothing about television. We didn't have a television set then.